Hello, and welcome to another edition of Talk Vietnam. Both our guests today are from the U.S. and have taken a deep interest in Vietnam. Today we're going to meet David Lamb and Sandy Northrop. David Lamb is the author of the book entitled Vietnam Now, which is the story of an American who sets out to learn about the impact of the war and how it has affected contemporary Vietnamese ways of life. And Sandy is a veteran documentary filmmaker. They are here today to share their insights on Vietnam. David Lamb's travels as a foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times have taken him to more than 120 countries and to all seven continents during his 34 years with the paper. His reporting has been nominated eight times for a Pulitzer Prize. From 1968 to 1970, he worked in Saigon as a battlefront correspondent. In 1997, he returned to work as Los Angeles Times Bureau Chief for Southeast Asia, based in Hanoi. David said he had four wonderful years in Hanoi, which was then recaptured in his book, Vietnam Now, A Reporter Returns. Sandy Northrop is a producer, director and editor whose documentaries have been shown on PBS. Her many assignments include working for the National Geographic Society in Africa. In 1997, Northrop moved to Hanoi, Vietnam. While there, she produced, directed, short and edited Vietnam Passage, Journeys from War to Peace, a trilogy of three one-hour television specials on post-war Vietnam. These programs offer an intimate view of the changes that have taken Vietnam forward from the ashes of a devastating war to the opportunities for peace. The Library of Congress recently selected Next Generation for its permanent collection. Thank you, David and Sandy, for coming on the show. Really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, now, you're here for a particular reason this time, or was it just a normal visit? Uh, it was birthday, my birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you very much. A big number. And uh, we decided... 70 years old. 70, 70 years old. We'll say. <laughs> right. You don't look it. Yeah, fantastic. Right. Thank you. Okay. And we decided uh, we didn't know where to celebrate my birthday. And we said, gee, let's go back to, to Vietnam where we lived for uh, four years. And uh, so we've had a wonderful time. We've gone to uh, Phu Quoc for the first time and here in Hanoi. And it's great being back. It feels very much like home. Now, David, I want to talk a little bit about your career. You served as a wartime reporter right. uh, in the 70s for six years. Um, what are some of the images and memories you have from that time? It's kind of a blur, a montage, if you will. I was here from uh, 1968 to 1970 uh, for United Press International, UPI. Okay. I arrived about three months after Tet. Mm -hmm. uh, but 69 was still a year of basically the, the last year of heavy fighting on, on, with major units, divisions, and regiments. Uh, but I'd like to know more about, uh, you know, what was the work, of, you know, what was the work like when you were a reporter, wartime reporter? It was. What, what were the motions right, that you were going through yeah. at the time? I mean, it was, it was dangerous. It was nonstop. It was seven days a week. Uh, how did you, you know, find your topics, your reports, right. and, and you sort of send them back? Or? You just, you, you went places. Uh, okay. And we had probably, UPI probably had 15 people in, in, based in Saigon, uh, photographers, reporters, editors. And I spent almost mo the vast majority of my time in the Central Highlands around Pleiku okay. and Da Nang with the Marines. And uh, you would just, uh, you'd go out every day and you'd just catch up with the unit and sometimes things would happen and you had news and sometimes they wouldn't. And the, the hardest thing in those days was the communications because you, if you had a great story in Da Nang, mm -hmm. you, obviously there were no faxes then, no cell phones, uh, we didn't have access to telex even. Mm -hmm. And so, so getting your story back to the office in, in Saigon was, and you couldn't just call Saigon directly, from Da Nang, you had to go through a whole series of switchboards. Wow. And you get the Da Nang operator, and you say, Da Nang, get me uh, Fubai. And mm -hmm. he may or may, may not come on, the operator. If you get Fubai, you say, Fubai, uh, get me uh, uh, some other city. And it would okay. take about six connections to get to your office. And oh, when really? you did get through to Saigon, 
It was possible the editor was out having a beer at the Bunny Bar next door, and the phone didn't answer. And, and it, was, it was just you spent hours just figuring out, filing your story. Now, did you use military channels for okay, Yeah, I mean, or? Uh, used to, we, we had, as accredited correspondents, you had access to military transportation, briefings, and so forth. So if it, you would just go out to the airport, and uh, there were actually scheduled military flights, say, from Saigon to, the, to, the, to Da Nang, and you'd go out to a helicopter uh, landing spot, and you'd run up when one came in and say, are you going to where I wanted to go to? And if, if he was, you'd say, get on board. And if, he, if you say, no, I'm going here, then you waited for another one to come in. Completely pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. And, <laughs> That's great. Um, any fondest memories or, or difficult memories that you'd like to share with uh, us? My fondest memory the first time was leaving Vietnam. I Anything. mean, yeah, yeah, you know, thank God I survived this. Yeah. I'm getting out. I'm going back to the... Yeah, you're still alive. Yeah, yeah, and what we used to call the big PX in the sky, and that mm -hmm. was the United States. And we were in Saigon for the 25th anniversary uh, of the end of the um, American War. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was so, so different because you had all the children, you know, the parades, the wonderful mm -hmm. color that comes with uh, Vietnam and... Uh, celebrations like that and uh, the juxtaposition about what Dave's describing at the end of the war in 75 and the fear of Americans and all the Americans that had come back for the 25th anniversary was phenomenal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me Sandy about your first experience coming to Vietnam. You know we fell in love with it immediately. We've lived in a lot of different countries. We've, we've lived in Kenya, uh, we lived in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, in uh, Cairo, Egypt and uh, so this was our third posting for me abroad, and uh, it sounded, Vietnam sounded interesting. I had been a hippie. I protested the war. Uh, Dave and I say we would have been on different sides of the war at the time. Uh, so I didn't know what to expect. I'd never spent a lot of time in Asia. And, and immediately it was a love affair, uh, that, and it was the people. Uh, everybody was kind. They were generous. Uh, they were just out, uh, outgoing. And uh, especially the young kids, they were just determined uh, that they had been on economic hard times. They had grown up poor. We knew about ration cards. We knew a lot about a lot about their lives as they told it to us, the stories. And uh, they were just so eager to move on. Uh, they would practice their English on us. Uh, mm -hmm. They would uh, come into the, the office and read the paper, or they would ask questions about my cameras or uh, how to do this. Uh, they were working two jobs, they were going to school, they wanted uh, to be a part of uh, their own dream, and they were making their dreams happen, and that's what we fell in love with. Mm -hmm. we, loved it. we loved it from the minute. So when you guys came back in 1997, now I'm going to get back. What are what were your first impressions from the change, and and you know also your experience? Uh, I think I shared Sandy's view that this is a country I don't know. This is a brand new experience. It's like I it's like I was never, never here before. Here. That was just something in the distant past. And uh, uh, and it, I mean it was as Sandy said, it was a very exciting time in Vietnam in '97. I mean everything was new. The economy was just opening up reconciliation between the United dialogue, States and Vietnam, finally. dialogue, uh, and you really had this feeling, it was very exciting, you were kind of living on this frontier, if you will, that, that the rest of the world didn't know much about. The mm -hmm. tourism industry was just starting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really felt we were on the, on the cusp of, of this brand new thing opening up. It was a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. Now, David, between 1997 and 2001, you were working as the chief of the Southeast Asia Correct. Department of the Correct. So Los I was Angeles traveling Times. through all of the ASEAN countries. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So what are some of the themes and topics that you that most impressed you or that were striking for you and interesting for you to report on during that I, time? I think uh, the major one was, and, and it was sort of, it wasn't, it was done in a nuanced way, I think, was reconciliation. Okay. And mm -hmm. that was a really very moving and uh, fascinating process to see that evolve. And mm -hmm. I, I remember one of the most interesting 
stories I think I wrote here was when I hooked up with a bunch of American uh, veterans who would come back, and it had been arranged so that they could go, this was near Da Nang, and meet the, soldier, the North Vietnamese soldiers that they fought against. And it was really a, a remarkable uh, event. Yeah. It, it, yeah, and it's just, uh, and it, it, all the Americans uh, in, in that group, it, it just, it was such a relief to them to break down the, the ice wall that had formed and find out, gee, these are nice people, and mm -hmm. they were believing in their homeland and their families and so forth, just like we were. Mm -hmm. Really quite a remarkable uh, mm -hmm. uh, people. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite stories of days is, is the family, the family reunion. I got to know a family near Da Nang, and in about 1968, they, no, it was up for, in Dong Han, near Dong Han, near the DMZ. And about 1968, the smartest son of three, the parents told him, you've got to go to the north, cross the Ben Hai River, all alone, this kid, because you will get a better education there. And here in this area, there's going to be nothing but fighting. So the, the eight-year-old went all alone, wow. made his way, lived, lived with the family, Today is a very well-known orthopedic surgeon wow. in, in Hanoi. Oh, I got his, shivers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his two brothers story. stayed in the South, and they joined the South Vietnamese Army. And I went with them, the three brothers, when they went to Dong Ha to visit their 80-year-old mother. And it was just a, really a moving story. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, of course, they all get along, and the, the, the divisions are healed, but uh, it, was, it was just... It really said to me it was a symbol of, of what the war had been about and the healing after the war. Mm -hmm. So you were here first as a wartime reporter, but then came back in 1997 with fresh eyes, right. basically. Right. Well. I hope they were fresh. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know any other American wartime reporters that have come back? And oh, yeah, through? dozens, dozens yeah. of them. Uh, I was the, only, the first one, though, the first newspaper reporter who had covered the war in the South, because obviously we couldn't come to the North in those mm -hmm. days and then who came back to open a bureau and live permanently in Hanoi. But, uh, it's, and it's sometimes there would be 500 reporters running around Vietnam during the war, mm -hmm. and during Tet it got up to like 1,500. Wow. And so I know, geez, I know scores of them, and I'd say the majority have been back at least to find out, you know, for a, a week or whatever. And, What's it like today? <laughs> yeah, exactly, and, and there's going to be a, a big reunion of journalists in, in Ho Chi Minh City, April 25th, Okay. They're coming from all over the world, mm -hmm. and uh, so the, a lot of them have come back. But I was really fortunate that Sandy and I could, could live here, and we could really sink our feet into the society and, mm -hmm. and, and learn. Mm -hmm. David, I'd like to know a little bit more about your work now uh, in the U.S. What are you mm -hmm. up to? <laughs> well, I took a uh, retired from the Los Angeles Times mm -hmm. in 2004 after 34 years with the paper. And wow, uh, and I do some I do some freelancing now, magazine freelancing, and mm -hmm. that's uh, gotten me back to Vietnam twice for two articles to Singapore and Indonesia uh, a couple of months ago. And so my 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 interest in Asia and Vietnam continues, and uh, luckily I can find someone occasionally who will pay my way and pay a yeah. pay a, a writer's fee. Yeah. That's great. And where are you guys settled now, um, currently in the U.S.? We live uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., in Alexandria, Virginia, which is the United States, one of the United States' oldest cities. It mm -hmm. was a port city. Uh, we used to have George Washington uh, ride through about one block away. Uh, we wow. weren't there. Mm -hmm. Robert E. Lee, uh, the Civil War general for the South, uh, many people were stationed there, and uh, we live in a house that, that's not old by Vietnamese standards, uh, but it's uh, it's 110 years old, and uh, we're, we're, we just delight in, do, in living there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, a report from our VTV correspondent in uh, the U.S. Uh, about the lives of Sandy and David, so let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, is our first Christmas and uh, our first uh, Tet in Vietnam. Was it? Mm -hmm. And so, so there, there are the trees. Kum, kumquat, kumquat yeah. trees. Kumquat. Right. kumquat. Yeah. And uh, people buying flowers. Yeah. Oh, and this was our trip to um, the rehabilitation camp outside yeah, of the uh, Friendship uh, Village. Yeah, but look at this. Uh, there, there's all the bicycles. Yeah. And and still, the old quarter still looks like that, doesn't it? It really did. Yeah, it it, it really still looked yeah. look pretty much the same. Yeah.
These are the stories David and Sandy often recall together, though these moments are not many. Every day after breakfast, David goes to his study on the second floor, walking toil throughout the day on his articles. This map marks the more than 120 countries David has been to during his career as a reporter, but Vietnam remains where he has the most affection for and connections with. That's why his room is packed with souvenirs from Vietnam. Downstairs, Sandy is concentrating on a new film project. A veteran director producer Contributing to tens of documentaries airing on PBS and National Geographic, Sandy still takes the most pride in the Vietnam trilogy. The three documentaries were made based on David and Sandy's experience in Vietnam. David and Sandy recalled that the first days of their return home from the U.S. were really difficult for them both because they missed the place. And finally, they found a source of consolation. We have a lot of Vietnamese American friends here in the uh, in Virginia and Washington D.C. Um, and we see lots of we've got lots of friends at the Vietnamese embassy here and Americans that were diplomats in Hanoi. So part of it we've overcome by maintaining our our contacts and our links to Vietnam and maybe even strengthening them. And we, there, we've been a good many Vietnamese come into the United States and when they come to Washington some of them stay with us. Uh, so we really don't feel completely isolated from Vietnam anymore. We really feel we're quite aware of what's going on there politically and economically and, and um, th that's one of the ways I think we've overcome missing the place. In, in the last two years we've had a, a Tet dinner on Tet in a Vietnamese restaurant with about eight friends. So wow. you know, we, we, we still abide by the traditions. Yeah. Right. Although their current daily work does not have much to do with Vietnam, Sandy and David say they still consider Vietnam as a second home and an integral part of their lives. Now, let's talk a little bit, uh, David, about your book, uh, Vietnam Now. Uh, when was it published? 2002, I believe. Okay. Yeah. And how long did it take you to write it and, and produce it? Well, r really, um, it took four years to research it because I was running around doing articles for the Los Angeles Times. Mm -hmm. So those articles really formed the, the basis of the book. And, and then when I sat down to write the book and I had my old articles to refer to, they all got massaged and put into a very different format and, and expanded. But So it was really four years. and. Uh, to research and uh, and then one year, a little less than a year, to do the actual writing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We hope in both uh, my films and, and Dave's yeah. book that that we interest people in Vietnam and that they will come and visit Vietnam for themselves, mm -hmm. and that that we we bring up enough questions, we introduce enough personalities that that they feel that 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 they have when they get off a plane that that they know what they're, they're going into, that they're going to meet wonderful people and have an adventure. Yeah. That's great. Um, when you started writing the book and, and throughout the process, um, did you ever think, you know, what's my main message? What am I trying to, uh -huh. to convey? And uh, if so, what was, you know, what was your um, position? Yeah, the point of view is obviously you can't be wishy-washy when mm -hmm. you're writing a book. The, the reader needs to know what track you're taking them down. And uh, I, don't, I don't think I set out initially in writing the book to say, Reconciliation is one of the most interesting topics, but I think that just started evolving as I was writing, and perhaps it wasn't until I got halfway through that I saw how important the reconciliation theme was becoming uh, to the book. Mm -hmm. Tell me in, in a few sentences what the book is about and uh, what people can find when, when reading it. It's, um, it's, it's not a book about the war, although there are many references to the war, and, but uh, I, I think the book is, is a uh, book about uh, self-discovery, mine, and discovering this country that um, I saw was so different in 68 and, and being drawn into this seductively compelling and attractive city and, and, and meeting people. Uh, that's great. I want to know uh, a little bit more about the feedback you received when, you, when it was published. What were people's reaction? I mean, it, got, it got really good reviews because I think I filled a gap, as Sandy's films did, 
in the knowledge of the Americans who still thought of Vietnam as, as to use the old cliche, they still thought of Vietnam as a war as, as opposed to a country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the, the reviews were, were really good and it continues to sell. It's not a bestseller, but a lot of people coming here, diplomats, tourists, journalists will have read it or have a copy under their arm. So I think it's, it's, it's found a niche and, and I think I have helped bridge the gap between ignorance and, and knowledge of a country. And understanding, I perhaps, hope so, right. right. I think I have, right. right. Yeah. We have a clip of uh, basically you and your book, and, and so if viewers are interested in learning a little bit more about your Please. book, uh, I invite you to take a look at that. David Lamb missed Hanoi when he was away. He confessed this right from the first page of his book, Vietnam Now. One day when a bartender in Thailand saw me with a plane ticket in hand and asked where I was headed, I replied, home. You mean the US? he asked. No, I said, Hanoi. Vietnam now is told from the perspective of an American reporter returning after the war and wondering about its impact and curious to learn more about Vietnam's present way of life. Lam was touched by family reunions and the reconciliation with American veterans after the war, which he witnessed. His expertise as a seasoned reporter shines through in this book. Each chapter delves into a facet of present-day Vietnamese life, complete with interviews, descriptions, his personal reaction, and detailed analysis. Chapter by chapter, the book reveals Lam's journey of discovering Vietnam and discovering his affections for the country, which he confirmed right from the first page of his book. Vietnam was no longer just my male drum. It was where I thought of home as being, and it seemed odd that I could feel so at peace in a land I once disliked so intensely. You also wrote, The Vietnamese taught me many things about patience, the value of forgiveness, the strength of community and family. Uh, now, did these realizations come at a specific time, or, or was it just, you it know, It was a slowly? collection, of, okay. you're right, of sort of, over time. Impressions over time, absolutely, okay. yeah. Okay. And those are certainly, you know, admirable qualities that every people in every country want to have the family and the industriousness and so forth. And, and uh, uh, Vietnam really wears that logo on their forehead. They mm -hmm. are indeed industrious people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of family values, yeah, also, it's a lot of So important, yeah. right? So yeah. ancestor worship, the whole thing, it's mm -hmm. so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You both have a, a deep and thorough understanding of of Vietnam and, and Vietnamese society and Vietnamese culture. Now, what would you say to someone who, you know, perhaps only knows Vietnam through war images in the media and things like that? How would they, you know, what would you like to know about Vietnam? I think we pretty much covered that. It, it, it's about uh, the, the next generation uh, yeah. and, and how they move forward thinking that the war had, the American war really had no impact on them. And in fact, it had all kinds of impact on them. Mm -hmm. uh, that that the moving forward, that that this generation, let's say, now the 35 and under are doing, uh, it, it's just phenomenal the steps that they've made, uh, knowing uh, where they've come from. As we were talking about the ration lines and uh, th uh, everything about their life, uh, ha has been just a huge strides from the past. Uh, the changes we saw uh, now from when we first came in 1997 are, are just unbelievable, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And not only in terms of, of education, there, but health care has mm -hmm. just gotten so much better. Uh, the cooperation between the United States is now just, it, nobody even talks about it. It's a thing of the past. When we were here, as we said, uh, people talked about it all. How will this come about? You know, What will the trade agreement be? It's over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that was a moment in time. And everybody is just uh, moving on and, and taking on the, the brass ring mm -hmm. and running with it. Forward thinking, forward Very thinking. Very much so. Yeah. Now I want to turn to Sandy. Um, 
you've produced a lot of documentary films uh, in, in your lifetime, including three on Vietnam. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I, I started doing, uh, I've been making movies all my life. How long, how long? Uh, 42 years. 42 years. So after I did the first film, which was on American Reconciliation and Pete Peterson, uh, I really began, uh, Dave and I were both interested in, uh, so how did the Vietnamese consider the American War? And of course, Americans themselves have no idea that the war was called the American War. And uh, so to, to do five different stories, six different stories on uh, three from the North, three from the South, on how people in Vietnam got through the war mm -hmm. and what their attitudes were, uh, it was very well received because it was information that nobody had uh, mm -hmm. done until I did that. Yeah, it was completely yeah. novel. Yeah, and uh, I mean the stories were wonderful. Uh, we the, one of the the ones that well we did Chin Kun Sun, who was the wonderful wonderful singer, mm -hmm. and he was kind of uh, I liked him because he was like a hippie, make love not war, and he was always trying to embrace with his beautiful ballads and his guitar playing. The, the whole concept that, hey, guys, we, we are one country. Mm -hmm. uh, I did one, one of the stories from Vietnam Passages was on Anne Tran, who runs Anne Tours in mm -hmm. Ho Chi Minh City, who put her sons, age five and four, on a plane at the very end of the war and didn't see them for 17, 17, years. 17 wow. years. They didn't know, if, n neither, the mother didn't know if her two kids were alive okay. or dead, the two kids didn't know if her mother was their mother was alive. Mm -hmm. And she started a tour agency in order to try to find her sons. And she would write postcards and say, uh, uh, Tony and Tim Tran, USA. And no, no address. Just no address. Yeah. And so eventually there was a tourist from San Jose who arrived. And he says, you know, I, I can try to help you find your kids. And it turned out that Tony and Tim were growing up in San Jose. Wow. And that one day uh, Tony picked up the phone and uh, a gentleman said, you know, found out the details. Uh, three months later, there was a phone call, and it was from his mother. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And they came back, and Tony has never left. That's uh, such a touching story. Yeah. And then in Dong Ha, I also found a young woman who uh, was the sole support of her family, and it mm. turned out that she had had her right leg blown off by a landmine. Uh, she had stepped on in the family rice paddy, had stepped mm -hmm. on it. And uh, she had... Uh, just uh, got a wooden leg. As best, she'd been through three or four of them. Some of them worked, some didn't, but it didn't stop her from working. Mm -hmm. A true survivor. Right? And Absolutely. after the film, the story unfolding is that she, uh, she had never had a lot of confidence. Uh, she didn't feel that anybody would ever want to marry her because she had lost her leg. Uh, she didn't think of herself as attractive. And that I, be selecting her, gave her a confidence that she hadn't had before. And she wrote me a lovely letter. She went on uh, in the Paralympics. Uh, she has now you won know the, the, yeah, four special Olympics. handicapped yeah, yeah. Olympics. Yeah. Uh, Fung has now won five gold medals for Vietnam in the Asian Games, not just at the Vietnam level. Yeah. Uh, running, long jump, high jump. Uh, and she works with other uh, disabled people who have lost limbs mm -hmm. uh, to landmines in, in central Vietnam. A true success story. Yeah, right? sure. Uh, there, 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 there are, it's just so many of them. So yeah. many of them. Uh, yeah. When you can take an individual story, and together I always do more than one story, mm -hmm. um, you get to see a Vietnam that you can't have when you're on a, on a tour bus, mm -hmm. uh, when you're passing through the shops, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the old quarter. Uh, mm -hmm. You get to see uh, people, and the people have stories. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, they told their stories very well, and I was pleased to tell them. Mm -hmm. Truly inspirational. In Vietnam, 80% of the population are farmers, and many are women. With torrential rains and floods predicted, Lei Thi Phuong works quickly to harvest her last remaining stocks of rice. <laughs> My family is a farming family. I began farming when I was 13. The work is hard and keeps us busy, but you get used to it. Fung is the sole supporter of her family. In 1993, Fung was 17 years old when she stepped on a landmine. 
She and her father were working in the family's rice paddy that day. It was around 7.30. I stepped on something in the field. There was an explosion. I fell down and knew that I was injured. My father ran to me and carried me on his back to the infirmary. One year later, I was given this artificial leg. Whenever Fong's leg becomes too painful, she takes the one-hour bus ride from her village to Quang Chi Provincial Hospital, which has a clinic specializing in landmine injuries. Now let's examine you. There's a possibility yeah. that we need to make you a new artificial leg so you can get around yeah. a lot easier. Fung is worried about the cost. Her last artificial leg cost $40, nearly half the family's annual income. She also has other concerns. If we make another leg, please make a lighter one so it's easier to work. Fung and her family live in a two-room mud house. The pride and joy of Fung's life is her five-year-old son, Ming. She wants Ming to do well in school and get the education she never had. Every day, in addition to farming, I spend some time, however short, teaching Ming. I am a mother, so I have to take care of my child. It's too soon to say that I'm proud of him because he's still a small boy. But having him has been the greatest joy in my life. I don't know what the future holds for Min, but I hope his life will be a lot less difficult than mine. Now, I'd like to know, you talked a little bit about some of your content, some of your documentary content. Um, if you had to sort of uh, describe the main message, uh, aside from, you know, connecting with people, what would it be? Well, each one was really, it was, a, each one had a different uh, concept, concept because the first one was about reconciliation, as Dave talked about, yeah. very important to Americans. Yeah. All right, did that, check that off. Next one is, well, Americans, you know nothing about what the Vietnamese went through. Let, let's, let's tell the stories of the Vietnamese. Let, let's let people know what they went through during the war. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then finally, the, the third one was uh, the thing that Dave and I continue to love and why we come back to Vietnam is the hope, mm -hmm. is that people have moved forward. They don't look back. They don't complain. They're saying, this is my country, mm -hmm. here is what I do, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they are, each one of the, the stories, uh, it ends with, I am proud, mm -hmm. I am proud to be Vietnamese. So tell me a little bit more about the process of producing those, those documentaries. I have to, in each of these films for uh, the public broadcasting system in the United States, uh, I have to raise my own money. And so mm -hmm. I have to go out and be both a filmmaker and a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, that's a Challenging, challenge. Challenging, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's always hard. And I would look for people that are companies that were invested in uh, seeing Vietnam grow. Uh, producing is, is always uh, a mixed bag. Uh, some of it works and some of it doesn't. Uh, but uh, there was one story on Ambassador Peterson. Uh, he was going to look for... Uh, uh, we took a helicopter trip to the top of a mountain where they had found some American MIAs missing in action. Wow. And uh, the Marines had cut a staircase up this mountain. Uh, I said, I'm five foot three. Marines are six foot five. And so I find myself just, just climbing up <laughs> this mountain. And uh, it, it was quite a day uh, to get up there to the top of the mountain. With the camera. <laughs> With the camera and banging along. and. Uh, but, but it was well worth it, because at the end of the day, uh, there were all these uh, minority tribes that had gathered. And when we got out of the helicopter, um, uh, Ambassador Peterson looked out, and, and it was like a mountain of people. It w they were just all... In, uh, no one could speak for a while, because there they were, smiling, you know, some of the black teeth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all just very anxious to see what we were doing. 
And for Ambassador Peter, it was the first time he had been to an MIA site. Okay. And for him to, to see people that were colleagues, um, mm -hmm. it was very emotional yeah, for him. Yeah, I can imagine. The greatest unresolved issue of the war is the fate of those soldiers still listed as missing in action, the MIAs. Peterson has pledged to make the MIAs his top priority. Today, he heads to a remote crash site near the Laotian border. Since 1992, a joint task force of Americans and Vietnamese has identified the remains of more than 500 servicemen listed as missing in action. Vietnamese cooperation has been key to these recovery efforts, from releasing pertinent archival documents to helping locate crash and burial sites. On January 10, 1968, First Lieutenant Earl Hopper's Phantom F-4 was shot down. The burned-out wreckage of his plane was located by the Vietnamese. This case has everything. So we have a data plate from the plane. We have bone enough for DNA. We have teeth. So the life support, so the case is very well round as far as evidence goes. But at the next site, the situation is much more typical. And the pilot's body was ejected about three or four meters. Captain Ross Fobert was 38 years old when a surface-to-air missile ended his mission in 1965. This is the third time the task force has excavated at this site. Trenches now stretch over 300 feet down the hillside but little confirming evidence has been found. So, we interviewed two witnesses initially, which told us to dig in the second white area from the top that you see up there. So we dug this whole area, still haven't found the guy's remains. We've uh, cleared, this time, 553 square meters. Uh, you can see that it's a, it's a Herculean effort to try and find uh, one guy. We have several pieces of uh, zipper which came either off of his flight suit or off of his life support vest. And here's the zipper. Uh, With only a zipper, like bits of leather this and metal, there can be no positive identification of Captain really Faubert. Sure Another extensive search will be required. But Peterson supports the task force fully. I don't know. I'm sure everybody realizes how uh, important the work you're doing here is to the average American citizen. This is being watched very, very closely. And ultimately, what you're doing now will be put down in the history books as, as uh, the final steps of a very, very long war. Nui Bai Airport, Hanoi. Peterson is here to attend a repatriation ceremony for American MIAs. Seven soldiers will be making the long trip home today. Among them, First Lieutenant Earl Hopper. The boxes will be taken first to Hawaii for final DNA identification, and then on to the families that have waited for their loved ones' return for over two decades. you've received uh, for your documentaries and the reaction of the public when they were they, They've been incredibly well received over the years. Uh, I, uh, I think of all the films I've done, I take the, the greatest pride in these. And the final film, Vietnam the Next Generation, the Library of Congress, which is our national library, has taken it for its permanent collection. That's so it cool. means if there's ever a nuclear war, th this, this film will be in some bomb safe mm -hmm. shelter somewhere. Uh, and it will be safe for posterity. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you, as a filmmaker, there's no greater sense of pride than somebody mm -hmm. wants to save it for posterity. Forever. Yeah. 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 It didn't quite go to the moon, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> that's pretty good, though. Yeah. That's great. Um, do you have a favorite out of all your out of your documentaries? I mean, perhaps between those three or, or in total? I, no, I don't. I, I, I think the hardest one to make was Vietnam Passage, uh, okay. the middle one, because I had a lot to learn, uh, the, the different points of view. And it was here that I learned that the Vietnamese always don't tell you 
exactly the, t- the, the, the complete story the first time. Mm-hmm. And uh, in many cases, I had to go back and go back and go back. Uh, there was one lady named Tio T. Tao who runs a fish farm in the South now. But uh, she, she was a young rebel. I, she's actually my age, and I relate to her very much because uh, although she lived in the South, she, she was a member of uh, the Viet Cong. And she, would, she marched down to the police station and said, you know, stop this war, the war is wrong. And for that, she was sent to Condell Prison. And, and she was just a remarkable story and, and a person that still speaks to the, the, you know, the fierce pride of Vietnam. We, we are who we are, we do what we do, and we, uh, we must fight for those mm-hmm. rights. Now, I'd like to know about your future plans, perhaps after that documentary that you just mentioned, but uh, what are you looking uh, forward to? Well, you know, I, uh, I still have a couple more films in me. I don't know what they are. Uh, you know, I, I, I've had to move uh, from film to tape and now to, to media, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it takes a lot of learning, and mm-hmm. I, I now rely on young kids in the United States to help me. Uh, I don't know, uh, really, uh, what, what the next film will be, because each film I take on really takes three years. Uh, the, the films in uh, Assignment Hanoi took, uh, aired in 1999. Uh, Vietnam Passage aired in 2002, so three years. Uh, Vietnam uh, Next Generation, 2005. So you, 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 it's a commitment of three years. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to focus on that, and when it's done, you just go, <laughs> and then you think of something else. For sure, you can move on to something else. But I guess it, it, it captures all your attention. So the, I, lo- I love making movies. Yeah. It, it has really driven me all my life. Uh, the way Dave loves writing, I love making movies. So aside from those you know, kin relation or family-like relationships that you've developed with, uh, with so many people here, and aside from all your projects and, and interests, what keeps you coming back? <laughs> We miss, we miss the place. Uh, yeah, it feels like home. Is it know, a second and, home? <laughs> and, and just from a personal point of view, just living here, we lived very comfortable lives. I mean, we had a beautiful apartment on Chukbach. Uh, we loved just having the bicycles, no automobile, loved mm-hmm. that. Uh, and we made, as we said, wonderful friends. The restaurants were good. So, I mean, we just in terms of physical comforts, it was just, it was a great lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And then you throw on top of that the... The Vietnamese people, the yeah. history, and all the things we loved so much. Uh. Mm-hmm. You know, another thing that that for, uh, for us is is our, our four years of adventures on the bicycles because we yeah. went yeah. everywhere on bicycles, and uh, we were just part of those crowds, and mm-hmm. uh, we had to learn how to flow mm-hmm. and, and and very move organic uh, in yeah. terms of experience, yeah. yes, right? Indeed. And, and indeed. that was exciting for us uh, to feel that we were a part of Vietnam because of the bicycles, uh, although we did take taxis sometimes. Uh, you know, I, I would do the shopping on the bicycle coming home from work each night. And, uh, you know, Dave would stop at the cafe and he'd have a coffee just like a good old Vietnamese mm-hmm. guy. And mm-hmm. uh, So it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. There was a little tea lady that I, I would bicycle by her every day. Uh, we lived in this little temple on Ho Chuk Bok called Lu Za. Mm-hmm. And uh, she didn't speak English. I don't speak very good Vietnamese. And yet she'd keep on inviting me to sit down and have tea and we, we we talk the best we can, and in fact we talk very well. Uh, but but we had it was just a sense of well, well I like you, uh, mm-hmm. you know I like what's going on. Mm-hmm. And you, we could look down from our apartment and we would see you know funerals, we would see weddings, we would see the Tet celebrations, and we don't have those in the United States. You know mm-hmm. we were a part of a very tiny village, and mm-hmm. we would go to all of the celebrations at the pagoda. Uh, we would watch the casting of the bells. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was still a lot more communal eating on the streets, mm-hmm. you know, where you get bang me and you would get the spam or mm-hmm. you would get eggs in the morning, uh, fa. Mm-hmm. and uh, it was just, it was so open. So, in a way, when you come back, does it, does it feel a little bit like, like a, an old home or, or, you know, a second home? Yeah, you've got that sense yeah, of that. De- de- definitely, yeah. yeah. We really feel You still feel like you have roots here. Absolutely. And we do. I mean, yeah. 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 And it feels, it feels that way, yeah. absolutely. Well, we don't go back to in Nairobi, Kenya. We don't go right. back to Cairo, Egypt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we enjoyed those. They were very, gr- they were huge learning experiences, but we never felt the yeah. sense of, 
of being a part the way we do here. Yeah, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, David. Great, you did it. It's our joy to share yeah, it with you. Uh, absolutely. Our love of Vietnam is never ending, right. and we'll be back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I hope to see you again and, and see your, your future work. Yep. And uh, we wish you the best of luck and uh, the best for all your future endeavors. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.